And last but not least, if you want your corn knee high by July, better get the plant, boys. I make my living off the land. This corn is beautiful. With aching back and callous pain. A lot of things gotta go right, yeah. The old man said you read what you sow. This could be some pretty phenomenal numbers. Out here in these fields of gold. Why well, it's called yellow gold. Crazy year, right? I'm an early riser, no nighter. Call me clown boy, yeah. I'm a fighter. Ain't gonna stop till they put me in my grave. It's gonna be a fun year. I'm a This episode presented by Pivot Bio. Way to go, they were just talking about they want something to go wrong. Right off the get-go. Uh, forklift quit. Don't know what happened to it. Worry about it later. No out here. Well, you guys ready to go to the field? I'm ready to go, so I'm gonna head out. We're doing some strip tilling today. This is our first year with strip till. The biggest reason why we're looking at strip till is still with this high management corn, our ROI is not where we want it to be. And we feel like we can get better management at the same time as saving money with saving you know cost on fertilizer. So we are cutting our rates back. You know, this is one of our better fields here. This is a 300 bushel field here for sure on, on an average. This will be a potential contest field. We don't really know for sure that this is gonna be a contest field, but it's definitely a high management field at, at uh, 300 bushel potential. Yeah, I got a little different mixture here. I'm doing some side-by-sides out here. So I wanna run this out, then I'll have to come over and fill up. So that's what we got going on now. So I'll, I don't know if I'll get two rounds in or not, but then I'll have to come fill up. That's what we got going on today. You know, with a strip till, we fight compaction so much. And with stripping here, I mean, we've already noticed when we come back in spraying that we've got a great base. And then coming back in, feel cultivating it. It's so soft, so mellow that these sprayers are so heavy. I mean, even when it's dry and it's loose sand, we track up these fields. These trips, you know, we're carrying more weight with our planter and tractor, and then we're side dressing, and then we come back in with, with spraying, you know, now wide dropping. It's just a lot of tracks, and it just, we're excited about actually having a nice base to run on. You know, this soil has helped us out on our timing too with a field cultivator, our normal practice, we wouldn't be able to be out here now. So it's helping get out to the field a little sooner. We've got three different pressure gauges here. This is your, your center of the toolbar, you know, behind the, behind the tires and then your wings, and then this is your row cleaners. So it's, it's pretty easy on adjustment. And this is the fold box. This your flow control tells you if you got a row not putting fertilize out. Pretty easy to adjust on the go. We're excited about it. I mean, this soil warrior has been doing great. I'm very impressed and excited about the outcome. 
On our farm, we're excited about using Pivot Bio from a net margin standpoint. If we can spend a dollar and make two dollars, that's a win for us. And in the case of Pivot Bio last year, it was much better than a five to one return. You've had an opportunity to test a lot of different products from many different companies. This product is by far the largest net return on investment that we've seen. We will use Pivot Bio Proven on every acre that we have moving forward. Hi there, Dan Lepkus. Hey, we're here with uh, Corn Warriors film crews here today. Uh, it's too wet for us to plant and do some other things, so uh, we're gonna go through some different things that we're doing on the farm. One of the kind of exciting things I want to talk about is the trials with Pivot Bio. Pivot Bio is a nitrogen fixing bacteria uh, you put in furrow. The idea of it is, is you can actually use less nitrogen through the season uh, or gain higher yields with the same amount of nitrogen. And I want to show a little bit how I'm doing my strips. Uh, I've got my in furrow tank here, which our in furrow uh, products are going through. Our fertilizers, or 318-18, some other things. We are mixing our pivot bile with that. In some areas we did a big portion of the field and then I actually shut off for strips with or without the pivot bile and then we have them marked. I have them flagged and then I have them logged into my field view. And the way I'm able to do that and, and get an accurate test is this tank will have the pivot bile. On that trailer sitting over there, that's got my nitrogen tank in the rear and it's got another starter tank which would be the white tank in the front, our in furrow tank. And I pull that tank and I, I have a valve system that I'll just shut off one of the other uh, tanks. I can mark it, flag it, turn a valve, do a strip, switch it back to the way I was, then we've got a strip. I can do that again over across the field several different times. We can get some multiple test data and we can find out if this stuff's really gonna pay and it's really gonna work. So uh, we'll track that through Corn Warriors and uh, what will tell the tale will be at harvest with yield, but we're gonna track it with tissue samples also so we can see the nitrogen levels and uh, that uh, hopefully will translate to yield. Uh, stay tuned. I think we're on a leaf fight, right? Leaf fight. Yeah, that's the name of the farm. It's a fun one. We name all of our farms after whoever we bought them from. So. This is the Life Fight Farm. Bought this a few years ago. I bought it because it was supposed to be a really, really good farm. And as far as the soil, it is. However, it holds onto a ton, a ton of moisture. It was just completely stripped of nutrients. And it, it's required a ton of fertilizer. I spent a lot, a lot of money uh, tiling this field. I think I'm finally ready to be able to pull a crop off of it now. Honestly, it's yielded terribly. I've buried the sprayer here and I've lost buried- shoes uh, out there. Yeah. They disappeared. And you've, <laughs> lo you've lost your glasses here. Yeah. This entire field is pattern tiled to help with the drainage. And we've used gypsum to help loosen the soil up without changing the pH. Uh, we planted a cover crop last year. It's helped the soil biology a ton. I can find quite a few worms and now the soil crumbles instead of just turn into a mud. That's a row. Don't dig up your, your, it's planted right now. So. If you can look at this, you got all these holes in there. That's all your worms digging. And now the soil just kind of falls apart. There's a nice little worm there. Every single time I dig now, there's a worm out here and I couldn't even find, I couldn't even find a worm out here, you know, uh, two years ago, so. If you look closely in this soil structure, you gotta, but it's just full 
of my new root hairs from the cover crop last year. When the soil's a little drier, they show up even a little bit more. I need help setting this A-B line in this field. Okay. Um, go to um, go to your menu button. Okay. Put it in Carmichael and field west or east? East. Okay. East. Do you know your directions? Didn't you learn that in your e-learning? Put it at an angle? Yeah. If, if it's not, if it's too sharp or something, you can change it, but just try it and see if it works. You want me to make a new angle, set A, B line? I just don't want it real sharp angle. Go 15 feet, hit A, and then go another 15 feet and hit set B. Just stay under the angle, but you know, you can set your A and B again, and then it'll you'll override it. Okay. I think I got it from there. All right. just. Go shallow, you don't have to go real deep, just make sure it levels it good. Thanks. Bye. Alright, see ya. Okay, it should be good. I am tilling or disking up the cover crop so my dad can come back and plant corn in it. This year's already been a hard year. We're ready to get it done with. I love farming. Every day at school, all I do is think about farming. But sometimes it's a lot of work, sometimes it's boring. There's a lot of things that's good and a lot of things that are bad. The most time it's good until you break something. And then it goes bad pretty fast. Did you watch the show before your dad was in it? Yeah, I watched it two years before. Every single night, I'd keep watching them and over and over. Who did you think was going to win before your dad got to I was thinking David. I didn't know for sure because that year was not the best year. Anyone can have a chance. 13, 14, 15, 16. Good there. So yeah, it's like your center is not quite as deep, isn't it? That's what I like about this here is, you know, we've got fur lies laying just underneath the top all the way to five inches deep. So, you know, it, it's mixed all the way down in there where some of these, um, I guess shank rigs you call them, it, it's all in one placement. You know, wherever the bottom of that shank and that tube is, that's where all that, you know, I guess you kind of got a hot spot there. So in my eyes, you've got more of an area. So even if even if the planter gets off a little bit, you're not doing a lot of damage. I mean, I mean not damage, but it's, it's still gonna hit that fur line. Just got a nice, pretty bed. My name's Greg Hallenbeck. I'm with Environmental Tillage Systems, or more commonly known as the Soil Warrior Strip Till Rigs. For those that aren't familiar with strip till, uh, a lot of times we call it zone till because we feel that we do it different. It's not just a narrow, concentrated band of fertilizer in there. We're actually mixing throughout the zone. And any guys are still disc ripping and then coming back with one or two tillage passes in the spring, plus maybe one or two fertility passes, nutrient application passes. We have some guys run in the fall only, some guys run in the spring only right ahead of the planter. A lot of it depends on geography, soil types, uh, and workload. We're looking at how to efficiently put our fertilizer down and keep it there, not only so that we're not you know, polluting waterways or that, but we're also achieving the ROI on that fertilizer investment. You know, what we've seen so far, I mean, we've, we've got a good base to run on and, and, you know, we're not disturbing that bed again and we're doing our own test uh, with a 16 row warrior. It's matching up to our planter. 
and what I like doing is, you know, we're running the same blends we normally run, but I can pick out certain products of that blend. Our, our goal in doing that is see what benefit that, you know, that certain product's been to us. So, you know, we're doing that many more side-by-sides. Uh, we'll follow up with some tissue tests to see what that product is actually benefiting the crop. You know, I'm, I'm focusing on my phosphates, my potassiums, and some calcium sulfur. That's um, the main ones we're focusing with. Leaving most of my nitrogen, besides what our DAP is supplying us, leaving that for my planter pass. You know, our farm average last year, of course, was down, but not down as, as far as what we thought. I mean, if you would have told me we average, we're gonna average what we did, you know, when I was planting this stuff in 1st of June, I, I would have bet the farm against it. But um, we were down 18 bushel um, per acre across the whole farm. Our goal is 400 bushel corn. I think we can grow 400 bushel corn. We've, we've uh, seen it on the monitor. You know, you need 400 bushel corn to have 300 bushel averages. You know, my populations differ per hybrid, of course, but you know, last year I got a little crazy and I do need to pull back a little bit, but you know, I'm still gonna try my strips. When I got a farm like this, it's a hundred acre field, you know, I may have six, seven different populations out here just to try to learn what works best with that hybrid. You know, as far as hybrids across the farm, we're still um, all agri-gold. Um, there is a couple new numbers I'm gonna try, but I mean, for the most part, it, it's the basic hybrids I've always planted. I mean. My favorite's 6659. I mean, that's that's been my highest yielding, so that's one I'm, you know, looking forward to planting again. You got the crown. I thought David had the crown. I want to wear it while I'm strip tilling. I got the soil wear just like David, so why can't I wear it? Planting season 2020. Better than planting season 2019 for sure. A fair amount of the beans went in early. The rest of them went in when I got done with corn, which was just a few days ago. Uh, when we were started planting beans, my furrow temperatures were showing in at like 31, 32 degrees, which is cold. Uh, when we were in corn, uh, 45 to 55 degrees as through the day. The guys in the south, they can talk about waiting and uh, you know it pays, but it doesn't pay up here. It, we proved that last year. Me and Melissa are out here checking some beans that have just emerged here in the last day or two. We just got uh, three and a half inches of rain about a day and a half ago. Actually, the top's great off pretty good because this farm drains fairly well in the soils. Uh, these beans were planted, I think, April 21st. So you might as well say it took them better than three weeks to get out of the ground. Uh, we've dropped our planting populations on beans down a lot. We've been dropping them every year. Uh, it seems like I'm dropping 10 to 15,000 plants per acre a year uh, without yield loss or you know even yield gain. So these beans are only planted at around 85,000. A lot of people would really scoff at that. Um, some people well, would add 100,000 to that. You know, they plant at 180, 140, 160. What we found is if you space these beans out more, singulate them a little bit more like corn, they will branch better. And if they branch better and the stems are hardier, they won't go down as easy. Um, more branching, more pods, more yield. So you can save quite a bit of money on seed if you drop these populations down a little bit. Um, they're just cracking through and we got a long ways to go. This ground's had, you know, five inches of rain since we planted it. It's still nice and mellow. Uh, I like to see that. Um, we don't have near the earthworms that we showed over at David's there a little while ago. I wish I had more like what he had that way. But uh, it's still, a tilt is real good. Uh, we'll see how it comes out. Well, we just two days ago, we had received um, three and a half inches of rain here fast, you know, so we had a lot of erosion. Um, the no-till held okay, but I was out in the field today that we no-tilled and we, it still washed down the row some, washed some seed out. Uh, the earliest stuff since planting's probably had at least six inches. 
Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Like we have to go when the conditions are, are right lately. It seems like the last three years it's just so wet all the time that we get such small windows that we have to go. It's not like the guys in the south that can wait. Um, we have to go when we can go. It's more about field conditions than it is temperatures or GDUs coming. Uh, we just have to be able to get the crop in and we have very short windows to do that anymore. I'm collecting rhubarb so that I can make a rhubarb crisp for supper tonight. Did you know that rhubarb leaves are poisonous? Actually and honestly. So you don't want the leaves. And you actually, if you mix the, the red and the green is what I like to do, so that you get the sour and the sweet. My grandma has the best rhubarb crisp recipe. So we will be using my grandma's recipe. Mm. Want a sniff? We think as farmers and as businessmen that we, we kind of have things figured out sometimes. But then a world event comes in and just kicks us right square and you know what. Uh, it completely changes the world within a few months, uh, changes the way that we're gonna run our farms, changes the way that we are gonna manage, all because of a virus and the way things are going. Uh, for me, it's been uh, pretty kind of depressing, to tell you the truth. Uh, I thought we kind of were on a pretty good path and all of a sudden now the farm looks like it's uh, pretty hard to be profitable. So we're concentrating on some things. Uh, you know, we always look to the future, as most farmers do. We're hoping that things get better. We have cut costs. Our ROI view has changed. We're like a lot of guys, we're probably a little scared of the way things are gonna be. We never thought the world could change on us this quick. We're just gonna try to get through this. It's really nothing compared to what our ancestors and a generation back went through, or two generations back went through. As farmers, we're uh, eternal optimists, and uh, we'll figure out a way. That's just kind of how we're going to play it on this farm. <laughs>